Aloha, and welcome to Pacific Business News' first annual Small Business, Gro Small Business Growth Expo and the Technology Seminar from Hawaiian Telecom. Thank you for joining us this morning. The theme of this seminar is Mastering Technology to Reach Your Customers and Secure Your Information. It's been said that 2013 is the year of the cloud, whether it's social, local, or mobile media app solutions. These tools allow you to target customers at the right place, at the right time, and with the right message. Today we have the opportunity to learn from some industry experts from Hawaiian Telecom and Computon. These professionals will provide their expert commentary on the latest cloud and security solutions. With us this morning is Jeff Cummins, Senior Manager, Product Management, Hawaiian Telecom. Stuart Swallow, Senior Sales Engineer, Computant. And Michael Miranda, Senior Manager, Product Management, also with Hawaiian Telecom. We're going to start with Jeff this morning. And Jeff, give us a presentation. So, good morning. Um, my name is Jeff Cummins. I'm the Senior Manager of New Product Development at Hawaiian Telecom. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about cloud phone system, right? So, and specifically, how you can use that technology, master that technology, if you will, in order to optimize your experience with your customers. So, to start off with, um, first I'm going to talk a little bit about what a cloud phone system is. Um, then I'm going to cover you know, why it's becoming so popular. And then finally, I'm going to give you some concrete examples of how it can actually be used to improve the customer experience that you want to deliver to your customers. So what is cloud phone system, right? So to begin with, you know, the one thing I can tell you is this is what it's not, right? So many of you will see this and recognize this as something that you have hanging, if you will, in your closet in the back room somewhere or maybe down the hall a couple of ways. And essentially what it is is a very fancy piece of equipment, piece of hardware that you know, manages your phone, phone system for you on-prem. So in a cloud-based phone system, the difference is, is that the actual phone system, if you will, the intelligence, is actually at the service provider, right? So that's why they refer to it as cloud. Um, and that cloud now is also known, if you will, as a data center, right? Very common term. So the second thing, too, is that, you know, as opposed to that phone system you have on-prem, on um, now, rather than having a bunch of phone lines coming into your office and the rest, this is all delivered over a single IP connection to your business, right? So primarily, a lot of you have heard of this as something like voice over IP. Um, that is the technology that is generally used in order to deliver cloud-based phone system. <clears throat> and then finally, <clears throat> excuse me, the big difference too is, is that, you know, in the past, if you wanted to use all those features and capabilities that you had um, at your office, you had to be sitting at your office. You had to be using the phone, if you will, the device that was sitting on your desk. And now that this is being delivered over the internet, if you will, over an IP connection, um, you can access those fu that functionality essentially from anywhere, right? So why is this becoming so popular? Well, number one, it's cost, right? So if you look at it, you eliminate a lot of upfront costs. All of that phone equipment, all of that intelligence, all that hardware that you have to purchase, and then obviously maintain um, over time as well as you know, any time you want to make changes to it. Um, those costs can be eliminated. Why? Because all of that is now being provided, if you will, from the cloud. The other thing, too, is you know, from a technology obsolescence, I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but um, you want to add something like one more phone, you want to do one minor change, and because your platform is you know, 10 years old, now you're forced to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in order to, shall I say, change that technology out. The other is an improved customer experience. So from the cloud now, because that is being provided from the data center, um, we can deliver that service always on. So even if something happens necessarily um, at your business or a phone gets disconnected or you know, some, for some reason the voicemail system isn't working, um, that just generally doesn't happen because you're, you're getting that service from the cloud. So it's always on, right? Um, the other is in terms of scalability. So as I mentioned before, you know, many customers are frustrated when they go to make an IT investment and they need to expand. Um, and all of a sudden they reach that breakpoint. Right? 
So the next expansion is going to be thousands of dollars in order to, shall I say, add just a few users on or add a few employees. And in many cases for a small business, that may make the difference between adding that employee or not adding that employee because the cost is simply too high. Well, with something like a cloud-based phone service, um, it's very easy, if you will, to add users or even conversely shrink them if necessary. There's also a lot of seasonal business as we know here in Hawaii. So um, this allows you to scale and grow or even, to, you know, if you will, scale back um, as your business needs demand. And then finally, business continuity. Um, as we all know here, we occasionally have uh, challenges with things like brownouts, right? Power issues, those types of things. Um, the nice thing about a cloud-based service, if you will, is that, you know, the data centers are always backed up, right? They always have power backup. Those things continue to run even in the event of, you know, a local power failure, which means that we can reroute that service, if you will, to mobile devices. We can even send it to other offices that you have. Um, that way we can keep the business running in the, even in the event of a disaster. And then finally, security. Um, as we all know, uh, implementing a lot of these technologies on-prem um, means constant patching. It used to be once upon a time, for example, you buy a phone system, it was all dedicated hardware, it was made by that company, they may even made the silicon on it, and you know, it wasn't very susceptible. But more and more, and in fact, every system today is standard IT hardware, servers, you know, from Dell, those, those types of companies. Um, standard software, operating systems and the rest, which means constant patching, constantly keeping up with what's going on on the security front. Well, obviously, from a data center perspective, those are things that we have to manage every single day as a service provider. And we can manage them very well across a large number of customers. So you benefit, if you will, from that data center's you know, defense in depth. So how does this actually impact what you're able to deliver to your business, you know, to your customers that are calling in. So I'm going to give you a, a first example. So example number one is something like an automated attendant. You know, in the past, if you wanted an automated attendant that was able to distribute calls to the appropriate people, right, it had to be at a specific location. If for any reason you couldn't reach that location or all the lines were busy, then guess what? You couldn't actually even get down to the automated attendant to distribute those calls. So in this example, what you're seeing is a cloud-based auto attendant that is able to take those incoming calls and distribute them, if you will, over a number of different locations and even to contractors. So you'll notice here that, for example, if you go from the sales department, right, because you've selected this, the second menu and you decide that you want to hit a, a dealer set sales team at the headquarters, that's not a problem. Or alternatively, you can hit a parts team at another branch location. And in this example, we even have the option for somebody who's like a billing employee, who's a contractor working from home, right? And then finally, um, online help team, right? So I know a lot of us too, if, if somebody's calling for help about your website, you know, that automatically gets referred to a partner, right? Because it's not something that we do core. Um, that's something that a cloud system, if you will, allows you to do so that your customers get to the right employee immediately and wherever the location is without having to list six or seven different phone numbers, right, in the directory. Another example of this is, you know, interacting with your customers using any particular device. I know for me, one of the number one things I use is actually my mobile phone, my smartphone, right? Why? Because I'm not sitting at my desk all the time. I use my desk phone when I'm there, but I use my smartphone when I'm not there. And with a cloud-based service, now you can use your business number on your smartphone. Right? You don't, you're not tied just, if you will, to that desk device um, because you're not tied to a piece of hardware at your business site anymore. So this is an example of an application that is available, right? That allows you to use your business number as though you were using it sitting at your desk, right? So examples are, you know, you can dial using your business number. You can look at the call history, including all the calls that came into your office number. It doesn't matter whether they landed on your mobile phone or whether they landed on your desk phone. Um, you can look through your business directory. So if you're trying to find an employee, it's very easy and fast to find them. Um, and then obviously you can reach out and actually use the phone system features. Like for example, you know, turning on your, your mobile phone, uh, your call forwarding features, putting yourself in do not disturb, those types of things um, directly from the device. And, and in this example, you know, iOS and Android are the two most common platforms that are supported by cloud-based systems. 
And then the final thing too in that is always being able to deliver a professional experience to your customers, right? So for me, I use this service on a regular basis and when I actually place a call from my mobile device, it uses my business number. It does not hand out my personal mobile device number. Why? Because number one, I want them to know that I'm calling from Hawaiian Telecom, not that I'm calling from my personal number. And number two, from a, from a professional perspective, if they're going to call me back, I want them to reach me on my business number, not necessarily on my mobile, right? I also know, for, for example, in real estate, this is a very big deal because the real estate office is spending a lot of money, if you will, to advertise those particular numbers. And they want to make sure that, it's, you know, that their real estate agents can be reached anywhere, right? But they're not handing out their own personal cell phone numbers, right? And then finally, you know, here's a good example of show, don't tell, right? So from a hosted cloud-based system, one of the other things you can do is web conferencing. And what it allows you to do is you know, share back and forth what you're talking about with your customers. So for example, you know, we publish out a number, the customer literally gets an email, clicks on it, pulls up the web screen, and now we can share desktop directly with that customer. There's nothing more powerful when you're talking to a customer than being able to show them what you're talking about rather than trying to explain to them some concept that is you know, technical in nature or you know, difficult to do without actually showing what you want to show them. So that's just a, a, an example, if you will, for um, what you can actually do by using a cloud-based system. A, you know, and one of the reasons why many of the customers are actually adopting business voice um, and moving that into the cloud. Are there? Oh, okay. But, uh, do you want to stay there or come back? I, I can stay right here. Okay. I have just a couple of questions for you to get started here. How reliable is a cloud phone system and how does that compare to you know, the more obsolete systems, old systems? So you know, in, in the past when you had a system, if you will, on, in the back closet on your wall, um, you know, any single component fail failure, right, would essentially bring the system down. Or I don't, I don't know if you've experienced this, I know we have, where somebody digs up, if you will, the entrance cable that goes into your building, right? And then everything goes down, right? And there's, there's really nothing you can do about that. So you contrast that with, you know, a cloud-based system that's coming from a data center. Um, those data centers are usually distributed, right? Um, they have multiple servers. There's not any one single point of failure. Right? And they're usually backed up with generators and the rest. And when the, you know, if for any reason you're separated right, from your service, um, then it will simply reroute the calls to a number of your choice. Right? And is that backup typically somewhere here on the islands or somewhere else? Uh, for us, yes. So um, we actually have um, you know, backup, if you will, in our data center here on an island mm -hmm. too. Right? So it's, it's not something where um, we immediately ship it off if you will, to the mainland. But that, that varies depending on the service provider. Yeah. And you mentioned the voice over internet protocol system. Is cloud synonymous with that? We have that at work. Is there, so no. do I have something like this or different or what? So you, you may have something different. Uh, voice over IP simply means that you're going to take the voice, you're going to packetize it, if you will, and turn it into data, right? And then transmit that from point A to point B. But you could have a voice over IP system that is still hardware, that sits on your premise, right? That uses voice over IP. With a cloud-based system, yes, we're using voice over IP, but none of the actual intelligence or equipment or servers or anything sit on your premise. It all sits in the cloud. All right. Jeff, thank you so much. That's what we need from you right now. Help me thank Jeff. <laughs> OK, Stuart, are you ready? I'm ready. So good morning, everyone. I'm Stuart with Computant, uh, senior sales engineer. And uh, so as, as they've already welcomed you, I want to say welcome again to the, uh, the first annual uh, Small Business Growth Expo, Mastering Technology to Reach Your Customers. So I'm going to be talking about cloud computing. So let me ask you. What is cloud computing? 
Anybody, just somebody yell out. All right. Um, so Jeff already shared uh, voice over the cloud. How many of you are using cloud computing now? What, and what is that? Um, like sharing documents and things. Like maybe a Dropbox or something like that. Okay, great example. So you'd be surprised how many of you are using cloud computing today and don't realize it. Um, Netflix. Very common cloud computing platform that you pay a monthly fee and you get to download movies or get DVDs delivered, right? Some of these things. Um, phone systems. So there are a lot of examples of cloud computing out there that you're currently using. You just don't realize you're in one version or, or another of cloud com computing. So <clears throat> to try to put a little bit of uh, organization to this, here are some of the, the industry uh, breakdowns. So you as the end user represent the blue and I'm the gray. So there's three segments that this falls into. Infrastructure as a service. So meaning uh, your technology partner is going to handle the servers data backup and storage, the network, right? Your firewall and routers and switches and everything that makes it all connect and, and talk to each other. But you are managing your own business application, whether that's a Microsoft Office or a POS system or accounting packages, whatever that application might be. Saving your data, um, the, the middleware, so you've got different packages that need to communicate with each other. You need to go out and find a vendor and buy these, these softwares that make it all work. Um, and of course, you know, the operating system on your desktop, okay, you, you typically are uh, buying your, your computer with Windows 7 or Apple or whatever that is. So you still maintain a fair amount of responsibility for this, and then you have some routine service that, that comes from a, from a partner. Well, platform as a service is probably the most common cloud computing uh, platform you're going to see out there. So your technology partner now is going to assume responsibility for managing the operating system for you and automating operating system updates, security patches, taking you to the next version of the operating system. Um, uh, the middleware. So all of this, this technology that makes it work now, all you have to do is use your accounting package. That's all you have to do. Everything else is handled for you. Um, and back up your data. Maybe if you're using a little USB hard drive and, and plugging it into your computer and, okay, save, it, save the data there instead of uh, not backing up at all. So this is probably the most common thing you're going to see for business software, with the exception of now software as a service. Um, anybody have an example of software as a service? What that is, is you pay for something and you go to the internet and get it. Maybe salesforce.com, uh, like the Netflix, um, some of the home user data backups like Cobalt, okay? So all you have to do is pay your monthly fee, you can go log into your account and, and take advantage of that service. In a software as a service model, they do everything for you. All you do is pay your fee, access it, log out, you're done. Okay, so this is the three typical cloud computing models. So why cloud computing? Well, as Jeff was talking about in, in, the, in the phone systems, Flexibility and scalability. If you are using cloud computing resources, you can get a, a server on the cloud, very easily launch a server and make it as big or little as you need to. Reduction of capital expense. If all of that computer equipment now is sitting in somewhere else's facility, you're not maintaining it, you're not paying for the electricity, these things. So it's a reduction of capital expense. 
increase collaboration. Now you've got these tools available to you from wherever you are. If you can get to the internet, you've got these tools available and shareable tools. So project employees where you're not uh, running solo on a project, you're, you're collaborating with someone for finance, uh, engineering, etc. Now you can all have project teams, right? That's a, a, a growing hiring practice out there. Of course, work from anywhere, anywhere you can get to the internet. Automated updates, it's all in the cloud. They're managing it for you. You don't have to update your operating system or antivirus or these things. It's automatically done. Reducing operating expense. Uh, one of the big ones, and I'll show you a slide in a minute, IT support alone uh, for small businesses. Uh, you see a lot of businesses go without IT support because uh, it's, it, it costs. I, you know, I can take care of my own computer. Now you've got a, a much more uh, cost-effective way to do this. Capable disaster recovery, we were talking about this a few minutes ago. Um, if you were looking for a business class data backup solution two years ago, it was, it was like swimming with sharks. There was no really good way to do it and you didn't know if your money was just being thrown away because you had tape backups and disk to disk backup and well, maybe the cloud works, but I've got this disk system. How does this all, so it was not a, a great scenario. And then security. Um, most of the data centers, um, some of them local and on the mainland, this is, uh, you've got, you know, DOD, HIPAA compliance, right, all these things that, that are going to cloud computing. Um, security is, of course, with identity theft and all these concerns, security is no, no small matter. Um, armed guards, fire protection, multiple layers of security to even get into the facility. So, uh, and of course, cloud access, multiple layers of firewall technology and antivirus, these things, your data is secure, right? So, Important. Well, what is the future of cloud computing? If you're not on it, you will be whether you like it or not. That's the reality of it. Um, we're already, of course, halfway through 2013, but think about that. 60% of all servers are gonna be virtualized by the end of this year. When you think of all the millions of servers out there, right? Millions of companies and they need a server to run their software. That's a huge number. Um, spending on cloud computing will hit 100 billion by next year. So this is something that the technology companies, the data centers, right, they're investing in this. How many times have you seen the Amazon commercials, Microsoft, all these guys are out there advertising their, their technology because this is where it's going. Um, cloud products, so the Netflix and the Salesforce.com and these things, uh, 56 billion by next year, right? Everything's moving to the cloud. And things like uh, the social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with all this stuff. This is the fastest growing cloud computing technology, or at least just the fastest growing technology ever in the history of technology, the, the electronic age. It's an amazing thing. So common cloud technologies, you know, I've already hit on a lot of this stuff, uh, data backup, cloud servers and virtual desktops, uh, business software and voice applications. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about these briefly. Uh, different options. I wish there, there was uh, a real, okay, do this and your cloud's covered. It, it, it always, it's, it depends. It depends on your business needs, what kind of compliance requirements you have. The, uh, the real message is now data backup to the cloud is a platform as a service. You've got a very feature rich data backup solution that uh, a technology provider such as Computant, we can provide you a very comprehensive solution, but you also have the tools to see and verify, okay, yes, here's my data, here it is in the cloud, it was, it's, it's there. It, the, the backup is successful. Um, replaces some of the very difficult technology, tape to tape, tape to disk, disk to disk. Um, you've got multi-data site storage. 
you can have your, your information saved here, Tokyo, Istanbul, New York, wherever you want to save your data. If you want to save it at all of them, fine. Right? So lots of protection. Easily managed because you do have a web interface to get to it and see it. Um, and of course, long-term archiving. So it's out there, it's cheap. You can save data as long as you want to. Servers. A server can be enabled, created, in just a matter of minutes. You can start with something very small for one person or two or three users and have a server that's capable of supporting thousands and thousands of users. And all this is done in just a matter of minutes. Um, rapid deployment. You need a server for file storage, you need a server for your POS or accounting, whatever the case, you can just duplicate them. Very fast, very easy to set up, and again, very cost effective, and I'll cover that in a minute. Uh, of course, reducing your carbon footprint. A standard server to run, say, accounting software. Just energy usage alone is 600 plus dollars per year. People don't realize that. How many servers do you have in your office? Five or six of them, typical. That's thousands of dollars a year, just in electricity. Then you've got software maintenance fees, software maintenance, paying someone to do this for you. The server breaks, oh, I need a new hard drive. People don't realize, it's a cost of doing business, yes, but people don't realize exactly how much money you're spending on these things until you compare the two. How do I do it in the cloud versus an on-premise server? Much more cost-effective model. Now, I'm sure you guys have all heard the term thin client or virtual desktop. Um, this is taking your computer, rather than using a laptop or a desktop, and putting that computer in the cloud and running your, uh, your, your computer, uh, your accounting software or point of sale or whatever you're using, just doing it on the cloud. Now your computer that sits in front of you really doesn't do anything other than showing you what you're doing on the cloud. Um, and it isn't just for uh, doing Word documents. You can do advanced processing things like AutoCAD, um, uh, graphics uh, generation. So uh, again, it's, it's one of those things, it depends, but having advanced capability on a cloud computer is, is a reality now. Um, some of the applications, right? It's not just email. Um, you've got inventory management solutions, warehouse automation, accounting, CRM, uh, online collaboration like SharePoint, um, office productivity tools. So, you know, a lot of people use Google or Office 365. Um, advanced processing, like I was just mentioning, AutoCAD or similar types of programs. Uh, document management, so saving all of your, your documents to, a, to a, a cloud service. You don't have to do anything. You scan it, automatically goes there. You need it later, you can find it in a matter of seconds. So great technology. And of course, your hosted voice. Preparing for the cloud, it's not just signing up and say, oh, okay, I'm gonna use this. Um, you have to have certain things in place. Your internet connection, a standard uh, home internet connection is not going to, to cut it anymore. That's the one thing. You've got to work with a good company like Hawaiian Telecom so that when you're sending all this information to the cloud, you don't hit send and you're, you're watching the little hourglass thing go for hours and hours. You've got to have the right technology to support this. Um, uh, secure access, firewall, antivirus. Guys, if nothing else, protect your identity, your credit card information, this stuff. Use, use the, the antivirus and, and, and firewall stuff, if nothing else, just to protect your own personal in integrity versus your business information. Application monitoring, network performance monitoring, these are tools so that you can see, okay, I've got this internet connection, I've got this cloud stuff, how efficient is it working? That's some, typically something a, a company like Computant would do for you. Um, and then partner evaluation and ROI, we'll, we'll go into that now. So selecting a partner, um, an established provider, right? There, it's so hard to navigate. Um, if you go do a, a, a search for cloud provider or cloud computer or something like this, 
there are literally tens of thousands of results you're going to come up with. Do you have time to go and call every one of these guys or, hey, show me a demo? No. You, right? There, there are big names out there that you're going to need to, to, to be familiar with. I mean, the Amazons of the world. Um, stick with the name brands unless they're uh, somebody local that you know. Um, it, it's just it's too risky. Uh, local support is important. Yes, everything's in the cloud, but typically you're going to need someone to help you with a migration strategy and help you at least get started and, and help you learn the technology. Um, don't, best partners don't put all their, their eggs in one basket, meaning I personally have had to, to uh, test and evaluate hundreds of different cloud technologies to see what works and what doesn't, what's, where, where's my money going to be spent, where are my customers' money going to be well spent. Um, so we've done a lot of the work for you. And choosing a partner with a diverse uh, industry background, if you're going to work with somebody in this, you're, I'm assuming, not everybody in this room is in the same business, right? So you need someone with the expertise to address your unique requirements. Um, and a, a brief information on Computon, we are a local company, almost 28 years in business. Um, we, we provide accounting software, cloud computing, data backups, all the things we've been talking about, the network to support it, managed services, and we've got a dedicated team of sales and, and engineers here locally. What happens if you pick the wrong cloud? Your, your migration strategy probably is not going to work taking uh, Office and going to Office 365. This doesn't happen by magic. You, you've got to have this done properly. Compliance, HIPAA compliance, DOD compliance, these things, uh, if it's not done right and you're not compliant, you may not get that department uh, a defense contract. You may not be compliant with HIPAA, right? And then you've got to go through the entire audit process all over again. Security, your information gets lost or compromised. Uh, you don't want the Secret Service coming and in, in investigating your business and why did you get hacked. Okay. Any questions, guys? Let me ask you this. Um, one of the things I noticed on one of your first slides was every one of those options still had a server. One of my misconceptions was that going to the cloud would get rid of my server need and I could get rid of that room that I have to keep at a certain temperature in my office, blah, blah, blah. Help me understand what, my, what happens to my servers or what doesn't happen to my servers. Great question. Um, your servers become a cloud server. So we go to one of the providers we work with and we create a server and it's, it's as simple as, okay, we need a processor, we need some RAM, we need some hard drive space, here's the operating system, there's the server. Now what are we putting on it, right? Um, once that is created, it's there, it's used. We, we, your, your computers say, okay, if I need this file, I go to this server, right? We create that network structure for you. Um, some of these servers cannot go away. Uh, for example, if you're a larger business that has multiple locations and you're on a, a domain controller, that domain controller typically still needs to sit on premise uh, today. Um, eventually, uh, with some of the cloud networking solutions, virtual networking, cloud networking is able to take over that. But, so you still need one server. You need a domain controller if you have a domain. Wouldn't going to a cloud-based server and paying what I assume is a monthly fee, wouldn't that be more expensive than the old-fashioned way? Another great question. So let's take a, um, a, 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 an accounting server, for example. So an accounting server uh, is with operating system and, and, and user license and, and things is, say, $4,500. Uh, plus the maintenance and the electricity and unforeseen uh, repairs, uh, take that number up to about $7,000 over uh, uh, the lifespan of that server, say five years. Well, the way that servers have to be uh, created and built for on-premise, you can't buy just half of a processor or just a little bit of RAM. 
the, the manufacturers package it a certain way. So in reality, you're forced to overbuy. Okay? So if you compare what you actually need to versus the on-premise server, um, it, it's that p paying for what you need. Uh, that $100 to $200, depending on the server per month, you compare that to a, a $7,000 price tag over five years, it typically is going to save the average business owner around $1,500 to $2,000 over a five-year period, just in one server. Wow. And if you've got multiples, then yeah. multiply the savings. Stuart, thank you so much. Help me thank Stuart. Yes, thank you for your time. And you guys will get the opportunity to ask him some questions in just a second. But first, Mike, come on up. Good morning. I've been challenged to make this quick. They saw my slides and they said, oh my God, how could you do this quickly? So I will make this quick. Uh, Mike Miranda with Wine Telecom. I'm going to talk about security and essentials that you should probably um, uh, keep in mind uh, relating to mobile devices, cloud, and your network security. Uh, just to date myself, Marinol 1990, anybody from Marinol? No. All right. Okay, Spartans. Uh, I used to work as an attorney before I really, really fell in love with computers. Went back, became a computer science major, became a coder. Uh, went into cybersecurity on the uh, DOD side for a while, and then popped out, and I, I'm a Hawaiian Telecom presenter. Uh, so I'm going to talk about mobile devices. Uh, if we look at some of the stats with uh, mobile devices and what our mobile consumers are doing, 94% search for local info using their mobile device. Uh, they visit after searching, 66% visit in person. Um, of course, we all do this. 44, 45% use it for in-store research. Uh, and 70% uh, called uh, after searching for a business on their mobile phone. You know, and, the, and the story goes on and on. We all know this. Everyone's using mobile devices. The, the sales of these devices are exceeding those of PCs. And this is their primary means of communication, primary means of computing at this point. So when I was thinking about mobile devices, I was thinking about, okay, what did we used to do before, right? Before we'd walk around with our mobile data in a briefcase. Well, maybe not me, maybe my, my, my dad. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, today, uh, we walk around with a mobile phone and, and a purse, but although I've seen a lot of women carrying more than one purse and many bags, but it's a mobile phone. So what, what's the difference, right? Back then, uh, access to this data limited to your briefcase. You open it up, you get it, there it is, right? And it's very visible, right, when you access it. Uh, indirect access to data is limited. You can't go into your briefcase and then go to your office, right? It's, all the data you have is right in there. Personal accountability for data loss. You lose a briefcase, it's your fault. You lost it. You come back without it, you lost it, right? Big, bulky, and hard to miss. Of course, again, you lose it, it's, you lose the data that's in there, you pretty much know you lost the data, right? You lost your briefcase. Uh, generally not encrypted at rest, the data is not encoded when it's, when it's in there. And uh, so when someone picks it up, they can easily read it. And data storage, limited by the physical constraints, right? You can only fit so much as what you can carry. So what is it like today? Right now there's multiple, with this mobile device, you can access data in multiple ways, online, you're connected. And also it's generally not visible, right? What you're accessing over your mobile phone. Um, accountability, this is one that's interesting. Now we can deflect accountability for loss. A lot of times, right? We say, oh, it's the technology, or a hacker got into it. Someone's, you know, someone just, there was malware on my phone. So it's not just data loss because you lost the physical device, but now we can say, well, actually, it's because of these other things. It's because of the technology. Small form factor, so it's susceptible to loss. There, are, there is layered security in these devices. There's encryption, there's passcodes, right? Uh, but in general, nearly unlimited data is accessible from these mobile devices. 
So with this, there's complexity, and with more data in the palm of your hand, there really is more responsibility, right? But the problem is, mobile malware has increased 30% just in 2013, right? To give you a sense, Android represents 70% of the market, but it also represents, at least in 2011, nearly 50% of the malware, right? iOS, right, it's right around 20% of the market, really has no, no blip as far as malware. Symbian, Windows, I don't know who used Java ME anymore, but one thing about Apple, right, they don't really report their, pub, their the data uh, on the malware. There's isolated reports, and they do have like over almost a billion apps at this point. So, you know, being a coder before, it's not as though there probably isn't malware out there or there are compromises going on out there. With that many applications, that many developers, there is some way. But in general, this is what's public. And if you do an Android malware search just on your Google News, you see tons of news stories about how uh, Android mal malware is all over the place. Like, this one that's interesting is China hit by, uh, 480 million smartphones in China hit by malware. Right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a lot. Now you do it for iOS, same thing. It's, there is malware, not as much being reported, but there is. Uh, there are compromises for the iOS system as well. And one, why is this important? Well, you think about how you run your business today. Let's assume that these, those bits are, 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 is actually sensitive information, right? You, you receive it in your computer, you store it in your server, uh, you retrieve it from your server, it gets to another computer, right? Uh, it goes to your server, uh, maybe you upload it to your public website, right? And then you start accessing it from your mobile device. Let's say it's a laptop, right? Now, where's the sensitive information? It's all over your network, and now it's outside. Whatever you're doing right now to protect your, your uh, internal network, now it's outside of that, right? And then, of course, at some point, maybe you email something to your smartphone or you retrieve it through your, through your smartphone, save the attachment, and so on. Now it's on your... Now it's on your smartphone. So that, let's say that's someone's credit card number because you're an insurance salesperson. Now that information is everywhere. And then you have hackers who already are trying to hack away at your workstations or hacking away at your network, at your servers. And now they're going after your mobile phones, as we showed before. So what can you do? Uh, now there is uh, mobile malware uh, antivirus out there. These are some of them, Norton Mobile Security, Sophos, Lookout, uh, for enterprises, there's Semantic Mobile Security. We are a semantic partner, so obviously Norton Semantic is something that we'd, we'd be involved in. Uh, but recommend definitely putting those out there. Lookout is free, uh, and uh, uh, also Norton Mobile Security offers free trials. Um, but definitely put something on, on your mobile systems. They're just like little computers, right? Uh, now let's go over some best practices, right? Have a separate mobile device for your business versus your phone, right? Because you'll tend to browse more casual websites, uh, entertainment sites, all sites targeted uh, by malware uh, writers to infect these devices. So if you discipline yourself to have a separate mobile device for work and one for your personal use, uh, then you know when you have your business uh, device and you're using it, you're not going to start browsing every which way, right? You're just gonna hit maybe your salesforce.com, you're gonna hit you know, only certain, uh, certain sites, only email relating to businesses there, so you, uh, the chances of you getting malware attachments a little bit lower. So separate <coughs> business from pleasure. Uh, update your software regularly, regularly and do not jailbreak. I know a lot of people will like doing this because they get uh, cool apps, but that's probably the prime, prime vector for malware, is installing apps that have not been vetted in any way at all, right? Uh, download only uh, reputable apps from trusted sources. Browse only safe sites. Remember, these are browsers just like on your computer. Same rules apply. Uh, do not connect to free Wi-Fi. Again, malware, uh, writers and, and hackers, they're on that free Wi-Fi as well. So if your system is uh, somewhat vulnerable, they'll go after it. So really refrain from using any free Wi-Fi for your business device. Your personal device, do what you want, but I'll show you how that might be uh, an issue as well. And leverage the security features, passcodes, encryption, phone home for that business device. They've, they've put that in there for a purpose and, and you should use it. 
So let's talk about cloud services. Right? We went over this, I think, a little bit already. But <laughs> you know, what is it? It's basically your cloud services provider has all of this, your data, the real estate, the environment, the hardware, operating system, application. They put that all together for you, and you just pay a simple fee. And they're different services, email, web, backups, productivity apps. Security-wise, and this is business continuity. You don't have internet, you don't have access to your cloud service. You don't have internet, you don't have access to your data. Right? Once you make that commitment, you have to understand for your business continuity, you have this risk. Right? So you want to make sure that you have good, secure internet at all times. So who's using it? Punahou's using it now for their students as far as the Google uh, Gmail, Google Apps. UH is using it now for their uh, students. Um, and everybody's using it, right? Gmail, you got 425 million users. Uh, Google Apps is rising in the business space. Um, Office 365, right? 90% of them are small businesses. Um, and, and it goes on and on, right? They're just proliferating. Well, one thing you gotta remember, it pays to pay, right? Google, and since 2011, they have free services. How many use free Gmail for their business? Right. There are a number of you, right? So Google has closed or retired 70 free services since 2011. That's a business risk for you, right? Now, is it likely they'll, they'll uh, uh, retire Gmail? Probably not, right? But one thing you have to keep in, keep in mind is if you do not pay, what is their obligation to you? Right? It's as is. There's no real support from Gmail, right? It's all self-help. If you do pay for this service, and it's relatively cheap, you get a 99.9% .9 uh, uh, uptime guarantee. If it does go down, they'll credit you. And there's 24 by seven phone support, right? Same thing with Office 365. So I definitely recommend that you pay for it so that you get this SLA and you have business continuity and you have a way to go after Google if you don't have access and it's their fault their data center goes down or whatever the case may be. And let's think about good old security for these services. One thing that's good about Google, they do have some advanced security features, but a lot of people don't use it, so they rely on what? Username, which is usually your email address, and a password. Uh, I'm not gonna go into how we should have secure passwords, but definitely have secure, long passwords. It could be a passphrase with different ways of writing it, like uh, I will not give away my password, and, and you know, it could be long and, and complicated. But don't make it simple, like the name of your dog or, or anything like that, because I'm sure that can be socially engineered. So what is the danger of using that, losing that username and password? All right, so I don't know if you know the story of, of Matt Honan. Uh, he was a, he's a journalist, uh, but he said, hackers destroyed my entire digital life in the span of an hour. And he just needed an email address. They, he was able to socially engineer uh, some, un, some other information, but it wasn't complicated. It was just username and password, essentially, he was able to get, or the hacker was able to get. And, and social engineering Apple, Amazon, all these other providers. So what did he do? What was the damage? Deleted eight years worth of email on Gmail, took over the Twitter account, uh, and started broadcasting offensive messages, erased all the data on his iPhone, his iPad, and his MacBook. So all his work documents, everything was gone, simply because of, uh, of the hacker's ability to use those credentials, username, and was able to socially engineer a password out, and was able to do all this, because we are connected to the cloud. So recommendation, of course, use a separate business address, uh, business email address instead of your personal uh, address for all your social networking sites and all your business activity online, all your cloud activity. Uh, use an alias email address. I don't know if many of you understand that. I'm going to illustrate it really quick here. Uh, but use an alias email address, not a real email address, when you sign up for online services. So to illustrate that, I don't know when I when I. Uh, First got my email address, this wasn't it, but let's say it was in college and Air Jordan was cool. I, I put in Air Jordan, I got my first email address. 
at yahoo.com. Shared it with my friends, and then later on, other services came on board. But what was interesting about all these services is that at some point they say, let's say you lose your password. Where am I going to send that password reset link to? Right? Usually you, you send it back to that good old trusty, uh, trusted email address. Then over time, other services come about, Facebook, iCloud, your banking services, everything else. And you point it back to that master email, email address because you know the username and password uh, by heart. And then you start your business. Right, you start your business, you start signing up for all these social networking sites for your business, and then you sign up for, you know, you go to ehoy.gov, log in online, sign up, put in all your business information, and then you refer them back to your master email address. So you can see what the risk is here, right? That master email address is now key. This is how Matt Honan got, got hacked as well. That one email address is now connected to all your sensitive information. If anybody, if let's say your friends got hacked and they found out, and that hacker found out your email address and started social engineering you for a password or took advantage of some Yahoo uh, exploit or whatever the case may be, they now have access to everything in your digital life and your business information. Right? So what, what can you do? Let's say I'm a smart techie, tech savvy guy. I'm gonna create my own domain and my own email address, right? I do that. I sign up for Network Solutions GoDaddy, but what happens? Oh, I still got to do my password reset or my critical e emails. Where do I send it back? I send it back to that, 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 that email address I started years ago. So how do you break that chain? This is where you use an email alias. It, I'm going to go over it. Not, it's not always easy to, to grasp, but an email alias is just another. It's like a, uh, uh, it's just a, another alias for a real email address. So what you do is you create, you have a real email address, which is XYZ, but you, in your system, in your email system, you create an alias, and that's what you use to sign up for all your business, uh, uh, all of your business uh, applications, your cloud applications. So what happens is no one can really log into an email account using this email address. They can only log into your email account using XYZ, right? But as far as all the other services are concerned, your real email address is that, ADM. And when you sign up for your network solutions, GoDaddy, for that domain, uh, again, you, you have an email address, but that's one you never use publicly. You just keep it private. So in that way, you can break the chain. And, and we can go over it again later after, after the seminar. But there is a way to break that chain to segregate your business using an email alias for all these online services uh, from your personal um, services. Okay. And so for, to summarize for the best practices, pay for the SLA. It's pretty nominal at this point, and it's only going to get cheaper over time. Uh, when you sign up for a security uh, cloud service, ask for their certifications. Ask for their, uh, if, they were, if they were recently audited. Uh, look at their security policy online to make sure that you understand what it is. Look at the SLAs and what they're going to, uh, and what they're going to uh, reimburse you for. Protect your email accounts. Use strong passwords. Use the advanced security. Even Facebook has two-factor authentication. So if it does offer that, turn it on. Um, and then access the cloud services from secured devices and secured networks, right? So if we go into network security, which is something that we have talked about for years now, so I'm just going to go over it uh, really quick, is protect the network at your business. Uh, use perimeter security solutions. It's more than just a regular firewall now. There are solutions for next generation firewalls, which provide multi layers of security against all the multiple uh, attacks out there. So don't just settle for a regular firewall, settle for a, one that's a next gen firewall, right? And uh, update your operating systems uh, and uh, install the uh, anti-malware and monitor the security events on your, uh, on your devices. You know, periodically check it or hire someone to look at it once in a while to see whether or not something anomalous is happening on your network. Uh, these are just the basics, and it should 
it should get you uh, 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 get you the, the basic security you need uh, and to keep your uh, information safe. Okay, and that's it. I have a couple of questions for you before I turn you guys over. Okay. Um, and Mike, the first one, I have antivirus on my computer, um, so why do I need a network security like a firewall beyond that? Okay, so remember, hackers have access to the same antivirus software that you have access to. So one of the first things that a lot of malware does now is turn off your, your antivirus. All right, so by having a, a perimeter-based security to monitor the traffic that's coming in or monitor the files, types that are coming in or inspecting the actual innards of these files at the perimeter, it prevents that from even happening. So you want to have multiple layers of defense. You can't just rely on antivirus, anti-malware on your, on your host. Is the Apple Mac operating system safer than a Windows operating system or do we just hear more about it on the Mac yeah. side, on the, op, on the Windows side? So, Clearly, there are, there's more malware out there for, um, for Windows-based systems simply because of the deployment. But I wouldn't just say that it's safer, the Apple's safer than Microsoft. For business, it comes down to behavior, right? How are you going to behave on your business devices, right? If you, if you responsibly behave on your Windows-based machine and only go to the sites that are relating to business, it's just as safe as a, an Apple machine, okay? Uh, and that's, that's very hard to do, especially if you're a small business because you wanna repurpose what you currently have. But to simply say Apple's safer than the other, I don't think it's that simple. It comes down to how you behave and how you conduct your transactions online. If you really are not disciplined to be able to do that, well, yeah, there is, you are a, a smaller, attack surface, or you're a smaller target if you are on an iOS system, but then you also have to deal with compatibility issues with some of the applications that are out there. So you do have to make that choice, but if you behave responsibly, and you have policies, and you have the security on a Windows-based machine, you should be just as safe as on an Apple machine. If you start going crazy on your business machine, then that's something else that can help you there. Mike, thank you so much. Okay, for the remainder of our time, it's you guys' chance to ask the experts questions directly. Please go ahead and step to one of the mics and so that everyone can hear or call out if you have a really loud voice and then just let them know who you're directing the question to or if it's not to a specific person, then just open it up to the three as a whole. Who wants to go first? So the question was, on cloud-based computing, how much can be done on the cloud itself versus on your system? Am I interpreting that correctly? Okay. No, great question. Um, in reality, now, uh, all of the heavy lifting can be done in the cloud. Um, uh, your, the ability to use, say, a thin client, uh, back from the old you know, mainframe computing days, now you can have a virtual desktop. Um, so the virtual desktop has the operating system. All of your applications are loaded, whether that's graphics or accounting or whatever you're using. It's all processed on the cloud resources. And your local machine is just a window into what's happening on the cloud. So um, all of your heavy lifting. And, and again, there's always the caveat, it depends. Uh, I mean. If you're an engineering firm and, and you've already got uh, a large installed base of AutoCAD users or these things, you know, the migration plan is, is the depends. But if, a, if, it's a, uh, if it can be done on a, on a local PC, it can be done on the cloud. If it can be done on a server, it can be done on the cloud. Does that answer your question? Mike, Jeff, anyone? Uh, I was going to add, the, the only other thing that I would add <clears throat> to that is um, while the cloud is, is extremely capable now of, of hosting almost any type of application um, that you want to, 
the, the other really important thing is to make sure that your network connection can also perform. Absolutely. So if you're doing a lot of heavy data, data storage, if you're running CRM queries, that, you know, those types of things, you just want to make sure that the pipe that you have is, is sized for that. And a lot of people in small business right now, um, you know, they still have a, a connection where the download's really fast, but the upload isn't, right? Um, and there are newer, te newer technologies. Obviously, we, we have a, a product that we offer called the Ethernet, right, um, that we now s set symmetric speeds so that if you're doing a lot of cloud services, then you can take advantage of them. Okay. Who else? I, thought, I saw a hand over here. Yeah. So you touched on it right at the end. But say we have a small law firm, like 10 people in the office, and we're considering uh, voice. Uh, voice. What if our existing internet speed is relatively slow? Is voice going to affect our data speeds? Or are the data packets going to be lost when we're talking? Is it going to be static when we're talking? What kind of issues are going to have with that? I would say it depends on the cloud provider you pick, right? So in the past, um, I'm sure you've all done this where you've done something like a Skype call and it sounded great when you started out and then you get about you know, three minutes into the conversation and all of a sudden it doesn't sound so good. Um, and that's, there, there's two things that, that are done in order to you know, alleviate that, right? So um, number one, voice actually doesn't, if it's just voice, voice doesn't take a whole lot of bandwidth. It's pretty small. Right? Um, especially you know, if you compress it, and a lot of the, the companies do, they give you the option of compressing it down, and 99.99% and of people can't tell the difference because they're used to cell phones. Right? Um, the other thing, though, is quality of service. So if you get a pipe that is managed, not just some old internet pipe right, from the low-cost provider, but you get a managed IP pipe, then what we can actually do is actually set the priority for the voice packets and then set the priority for the data packets so it allows us to keep a good experience, if you will, even if you're doing a lot of other data downloads. You, you, know, you won't notice the difference at that point. But it can happen if you don't have quality of service on the pipe and also if, you know, um, shall I say, you know, the, the service provider is not, you know, a lot of times the, the cloud providers, they might not necessarily do the network side of it too, right? So they have no way of managing the delivery of VoIP. Did that answer your question? Yeah, perfect. Because uh, some people are concerned that voice is going to eat up a lot of their data from their available pipe space. Uh, it really, it's nothing in compared to you know a lot of the data stuff that you're doing right now. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, an average call, right? Um, compressed with all the overhead takes around 42k, k, right? It's yeah, it's pretty manageable. Stuart, Mike, anything you want to add there? I want to ask something else, Jeff, about um, Skype. You know, we've all used services like Skype before, and the quality of the call hasn't always been as great, or it fades in and out. How is a cloud phone system different than that? Um, it really, from a technology perspective, is not different. Um, the difference is in the network connection, right? So if you have a service provider and the only part they're, they're, they're offering is the cloud portion, then you really need to, shall I say, um, uh, look at what your network connection to that cloud is going to be, right? This isn't really as, as important, if you will, with every single cloud application, but when it comes to real-time communication, stuff you're doing live between person to person, um, it becomes very important to manage that connection properly, right? Um, so, uh, you know, for example, at Hawaiian Telecom, you know, we actually bundle the service together. So our hosted voice service and the actual broadband connection with the management of that IP connection, it's one package. Why? You know, we're the, we've been the phone company here for over 100 years. So we, we know that our customers are going to expect the same quality that they've gotten from us, right, for the last 100 years to go on into the, the next 100, if not get better. Right. right? Actually, I, I would like to add to this real, real quickly. Um, so Skype versus uh, a hosted uh, cloud voice. Skype is a very simple application in respect. You can, you can make a, a, an online phone call. Uh, but a business grade phone system, you have your auto attendant, voicemail storage, um, potentially conferencing, um, uh, or a conference bridge. I mean, all of those business bolt ons, to, other than just making a standard phone call, you have that with, uh, with a business class 
uh, cloud solution versus a Skype, which is simply free, free yeah. communication over, you know, free That's phone calls. Yeah. I mean, so he, Stuart's absolutely right. Um, you know, when you, when you look at the feature set that you have, you know, 90% of what you do in a small business, you don't actually kind of notice, but all that routing in the background takes half takes place without you knowing about it. But <laughs> until let me it get, doesn't happen. Yeah, until it doesn't happen. <laughs> but all the most important thing is, is all of those business features that you use, you know, transferring to an extension, having an automate, automated attendant, those types of things. You know, you generally set up once and you manage from time to time, you don't make a lot of changes. But all of that feature set that you've had, again, for a very long period of time, that is really what's provided by a cloud phone system, you know, service. And, and you know, and again, another example is, is you know, we, we don't just you know put a client on your desktop when we offer this type of service. You get an actual hardware phone too, right? So it's it's a bridge, if you will, with what you you know what you're used to, but also allows you to extend that now to PCs, you know, uh, smartphones, tablets, the rest of that stuff. So you can use that feature set that you're used to for the last you know 20 or 30 years. But you can use the full value of that as well as new features across any device rather than, you know, just, oh, I can make a single call to somebody else from my desktop. Right. Okay. Thanks. Nice little hand here. Yes? Jeff, I think you just answered part of my question, but if we were to move our phone system to the cloud, then as far as a landline physical device, then will we have to use the phone that you provide or could it work with any other device? On a landline, do, you have to, do they have to use a certain kind of device or is their old phone fine? So actually, um, you know, when we when we do like our, our hosted voice service, um, we provide the phone devices for free as part of the service, and there's a reason, right? Um, we use standard devices. I mean, the devices that we use, we don't manufacture. They're they're actually uh, Polycom. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with them. You've probably all got one of their conference phones in one of your rooms. Um, but the reason that we do that, we provide the device for free, is because there is a lot of communication going on between that device and the cloud. Right? And we want to make sure that that device has been thoroughly tested, vetted, and the rest. Because uh, you know, our experience has been, you, know, you, you, you go and you buy some of the lower, lower cost, if you will, IP phones from you know, uh, made in different places in the world, and they don't work well. Right? And, and it's also what I've seen from um, people that we've actually migrated over from other cloud providers. And what they've universally said is, is oh, well, you know, this phone didn't work well. well yeah, I mean, you, you know, to that point. But again, we don't necessarily charge for that device. If you're going to get a subscription service to us for a period of time, then, you know, the device comes as part of the use, right? So you charge by user? Part, yes, we charge by user, right? By employee, essentially. Yes? Are there geographical limitations to where you can have these services implemented? Are there geographical limitations to where you, the services can be offered? Um, we offer them across all the islands. I think we even have an installation right now on Lanai. So um, uh, the real limitation is being able to get a managed IP connection from us, and that's it. But yeah, we have we have phone numbers too across all the islands as well. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm looking to go to a cloud service as we're computing data services and so on like that. Uh, really looking at uh, service uh, software as a service. Looking for cloud service, what kind of security requirements are we looking at? Is that fair? Uh, first, you want to um, look at their security policy and identify whether or not they um, are uh, certified. So there are different certifi certifications for their data center. So you want to make sure that they have a um, SSAE 16, SSAE 16 uh, certification. Um, you know, they want, you want to look at their policy, make sure they talk about 24 by seven um, uh, monitoring, 24 by seven security of their data center. Um, you also, uh, they would also indicate whether or not they have um, monitoring of the actual connections or their, their network infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So they might say something like, you know, I have 24 by 7 um, security monitoring uh, and uh, uh, what their response times are. Uh, make sure there is a good phone number to contact them as well. 
the as far as authentication, so usually you log in with username and password, right? You want to make sure that it is SSL uh, as far as the security for their login page. So if you go to their login page when you're trialing, make sure it's SSL enabled. Make sure no other warnings come up, like saying it's a it's uh, it usually involves a certificate. So you want to make sure that certificate is valid. You don't get any warnings from your browser that it's an invalid uh, certificate, which is an indication that they're not really keeping up with it. So you want to make sure that's good. If they offer additional security measures. So it depends on the, on the data that you're going to be storing up there as well. If it's going to be medical data, if it's going to be, if it's medical data, let's say you want to make sure it's HIPAA compliant, right? You, uh, depending on your, on your industry, if it's financial data, again, same thing, you want to make sure it if it uh, meets those, uh, those requirements that you normally have to comply with if it's on your premises. Right? Remember now, if you're also storing files into Dropbox that have social security numbers of your customers, right? you don't want to just put it in the free Dropbox. You want to make sure that it's, they offer the data when it arrives there is encrypted as it's moving over the network and also encrypted when it's stored. Right, so storage uh, encryption at rest is another thing, another keyword that you'd want to make sure is there. That way, they'll say for some software as a service providers that, yeah, our people have no way of accessing your data because it's encrypted. Right, so those kinds of things you want to make sure are in there. And if they are certified for HIPAA and, and those other things, that's also good depending on your industry. Um, so those are the key things that you want to look out for. Encryption, transit, and at rest. Authentication measures, if it's only username and password, um, and, they, and they offer, and if you do do it, if, when you do a trial, if there is no check of how, if you're able to put in a regular name in there and there is no um, problem with them accepting that password, they're not enforcing any password security requirements, that's also a sign that they don't take security seriously. Uh, so you wanna make sure that they do enforce password uh, security requirements, especially when you start distributing the service to your other, your other employees because you don't really control their passwords, right? So they might put in something very simple as well. And if there's no way of controlling that, uh, then you know that business doesn't take security uh, seriously. So. Mike, you mentioned a valid phone number, a good phone number, something like that. What do you mean by that? Well, one of the things that happens, uh, remember, if you don't have internet connectivity, you don't have access to your service. Right, so if the only way they offer you communications with this business is over email, uh, if you don't have connectivity, how can you get status on your service? Right, so you want to be able to have a phone number to contact them, and that it's manned 24 by 7, so that you can you can confirm that your data center is still alive. You can confirm that your data is secure, even though you don't have connectivity to it, um, because you don't know where the connect connectivity dropped. It could be on their side. It could be on our side. It could be. You don't know, but you, so you need that phone number to call. So yeah, sometimes um, the best way to get these things done is to have an active phone call. Even though I know we all send 20 times more email nowadays than we ever do pick up the phone, sometimes there's no substitute right, for solving a problem immediately than an active phone call. Yes. So, kind of related to the portability of it, of working in the cloud, right? So, I think you mentioned earlier working on secure networks. So, traveling to the mainland internationally, is there any things that we, we need to be looking for, I, you know, connecting to their networks, if you will, um, that is a best practice that we should ensure that proprietary personal information is being protected by mm -hmm. the, uh, the cloud service? And I guess, and I guess tied to that, you're seeing so much more. Recently, the VA was hacked. Uh, JP Morgan, I think, was hacked. You know, so much more. I know, uh, Stuart, you mentioned physical security with some aspects that you guys are doing uh, and increasing the, the firewall. What else, I mean, to make us feel comfortable, what else are you guys doing to stay ahead so that we're not getting compromised, first thing? And then second, if you guys are, you know, do we get notification? Uh, is there something that we, you know, hey, this is something you should do, what, or what have you, or a service that you guys provide in that so um, uh, the other panel members have, have covered uh, a few of the things. For example, uh, the 
the service provider, you know, are they a really good provider? Do, is there a phone number, right? There are certifications. Um, and our part of our service as a provider is evaluating the cloud providers we work with and making sure that they meet these requirements. So we're doing our due diligence there. Um, uh, one of the things I would strongly suggest is um, encryption software. So your personal machine, right, some of the things that you, uh, you should always do, like antivirus and anti-malware, um, and just in case you don't know the difference, a virus is meant to destroy data, right? So you get a virus and it kills your email or deletes files or things. Malware is meant to steal data. So in, in my book, that's actually a little more important. Make sure you've got antivirus and anti-malware software, which we can provide. Um, but the other one that it's not common is putting an encryption software on your, on your devices. Uh, meaning if you put something in any one of these, uh, you know, SkyDrive or Dropbox or this stuff, you can encrypt it where even if somebody gets, gets to it, they can't see it. When you send that, that data to a cloud resource, it's encrypted while it's in transit. So yeah, somebody may, may hack while it's in transit, but at least they can't decipher it. So that's something I would strongly recommend. Something like pre-internet encryption, right? Yeah. I mean, encrypting the data before you send it up Talk to the cloud. Sorry. Sorry. So um, what Stuart's referring to is also commonly known as pre-internet encryption, which makes sure that the application that you're using, right, encrypts the traffic before you send it up, right? And a lot of the apps, the cloud apps, like, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. I use a backup service um, for my wife's business, small business at home, and that backup service actually, the client encrypts everything on the machine before it ever transmits it off network. And, you know, when you do travel, I mean, you, you have, it takes discipline. It really just takes personal discipline uh, and acknowledging that you are the custodian of sensitive data, right? If you are the custodian of sensitive data, which would be HR data or, you know, like VA data or whatever the case may be, it's your personal responsibility to keep it safe and do what you can. And the basic discipline things, you, discipline, basic things you can do is, just keep in mind that it, business is separate from your personal work. So if you are going to travel, use your business laptop. And it's for business activity. Bring your business laptop. As far as data, if there is any way you can access this data without having to download it to your workstation, so it could be VPN, right, and do remote desktop into it, do that so that you reduce the exposure of the data off of the off of the corporate network, right? So it really takes personal discipline. And then follow, if you use a corporate laptop, then responsibility of keeping that security software up to date is part of your corporate IT or your business IT. If you are your own business, then of course it's your responsibility. You do those best practices. But you, it really comes out to making sure you, defy, you, you maintain that line of business and, and pleasure, right? And then once you commit to that, I think you'll be a lot, you'll start taking the precautions, right? Okay, that is our last question before the drawing, but let me, help me thank Jeff Stewart and Mike one more time.